Hello everyone, uh, my name is David Ensor. Uh, I'm a orthopaedic registrar at the Royal London um, and I'm here to talk to you about orthopaedics, uh, what it's like to be in training for orthopaedics um, and also to discuss how you guys can apply for orthopaedics after your F2. Um, I'm going to go mainly into at that point into the uh, interview process at CT and not really into registrar training because it's quite far. And I'm sure that the uh, situation will have changed uh, by that time, just as it's changed so much since a lot since when I applied. Um, cool. So this is fairly inf if you have any issues, uh, or any questions, just fire them into the chat, um, and hopefully the guys will just point me out, point them out to me, and we can answer them as we go along. Uh, so this is just a quick run through of what I did. Uh, I had my foundation year trainings at uh, in Essex in Princess Alexandra Hospital. I did my orthopedic training in FY two, um, and that was really when I kind of uh, decided that orthopedic was what I wanted to pursue. Uh, someone has said it's, it's quite late in that point to make that decision um, and it's really good if you guys want to start doing that now. Okay yeah just let me know if my voice is cutting out. Um, yeah so then I took a year out after F2 um, because that was something that I was planning on doing um, and I wanted to do, basically spend some time traveling. Uh, did six months at the Royal London doing a renal transplant job um, and then I went to, uh, did like a round the world tour in uh, four or five months, uh, having just having a good time. Um, and then I came back, did my core training in the East Midlands. I moved to Kettering in Leicester um, and did plastics, orthopedics and general surgery there. And then I, and then I reapplied uh, and got a job at the Royal London Rotation. And I've been in London ever since. Uh, this is also just to demonstrate you do move around a lot. So... Every six months to a year in training, you'll be moving hospitals. Just for those of you that don't know what the Royal London Rotation is, uh, so each uh, area has a training deanery. Uh, Northeast Thames is a bit unique in that it has four rotations within its deanery, and one of them is the Royal London. Our base hospital is the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. It's the busiest trauma centre in Western Europe, apparently. Uh, it's definitely the busiest trauma centre in the UK. Uh, and the hospitals that we cover, um, and that mean that when I say cover, I mean I could potentially move to uh, and be there for six months to a year, go from Southend to the Royal London and then out to Broomfield and Harlow. So it's quite a big area. Uh, and sometimes you can either be commuting. So I was, I was working in Southend before here. I was commuting about an hour. Uh, and I'm currently at the Royal London in paediatrics, and it's the best commute I've got, and it's a 10-minute cycle. So it kind of goes up and down. So just as a general start, uh, what is orthopedics? Uh, it's basically, we our speciality is the musculoskeletal system, um, and we, as a speciality, we save limbs and we restore function. We don't necessarily save lives. We're not like vascular surgeons and general surgeons, uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, if you want to go and do kind of like the really um, intense stuff uh, with the trauma things, then really general surgery and vascular surgery is where you want to be heading. Obviously, that's a, if you like to if you like the intense, uh, high pressure things, but also it means that you're going to be up at night um, and coming in very, all the time. Whereas what's good about all speed? Generally, it's good that you can um, come in and out uh, and bones take ages to heal or take. Sorry, can you still hear me? I've got a problem with my mic. David, it, it was putting in and out, but it, it's better when you've it's just working. spoken now. It still seems to be cutting in and out a little. I still don't think we can hear you. I 
I still don't think we can hear you. Just yeah, wait, you might be back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, now it's good. <laughs> or not. Um, I think it's cut out yeah. again. It's my headphones, sorry. It's not, or it's with this... Uh... It's hopefully it'll work for a little bit. Um, I might just need. Let's carry on, and we'll see how it, how it plays out. Sure, Sorry. Sure. That's okay. So yeah, uh, all speed dicks is good. That you generally, both, you know, they'll take a while to heal, so you can you don't need to come in immediately overnight. But there are situations when you do have to. Um, there are two aspects to all speed dicks. There's a the trauma aspect, which is the acute condition. So you've got the fractures, tendon ruptures, infections, and joint dislocations. And then we've got the elective side, which is more the chronic conditions, such as osteoarthritis and perhaps uh, um, congenital diseases. And that's where we kind of get involved in like, the joint replacement and reconstruction. So on the top right, you can see that's a um, fracture of the tibia, and that's an intramedullary nail that we use to fix that. And then at the bottom, you can see that's a total hip replacement, which would be used to treat uh, osteoarthritis. So within orthopedics, we pretty much uh, every bone below C1 is within our remit. Um, all the skull surgery is done by the neurosurgeons. And then we, generally now you're subspecialized. So your subspecialty will start with either be spine, um, upper limb. So that'll be shoulder and elbow or hand and wrist. And then pelvis and acetabulum, hip or hip and knee, or just the knee, and then foot and ankle. And then you have pediatrics and trauma-specific orthopedic surgeons. Um, so there's pictures, the top right, top left is a frame that would be used for um, either trauma or deformity correction. You've got a wrist plating that we would use in trauma. Um, the bottom left is some images from shoulder arthroscopy. And the bottom right is an ACL reconstruction. So there's a lot of variation within orthopedics. Um, and even within your subspecialty, you, know, you have a wide range of practice. So that, that, that keeps it very interesting. Generally, areas of work. So we, as a trainee, um, we are moving between A&E when we're on call. We're either being clinic. So that clinic will either be following up fractures um, or in our elective clinic, which will be kind of reviewing patients that have been referred from the GP with chronic conditions. And then we're in theatre, and we'll either be in elective theatres, which will be those chronic conditions being treated, or we'll be in trauma theatre, where we're managing fractures um, and fixing them. And just to give you an idea of what shift work we do, so during the day, uh, if you're on a day shift, you'll on a normal day shift, you'll do your eight till five. If you're on call, during the day, you'll do eight to eight, so that's 12 hours. And then if you're doing nights, you'll do eight to eight um, overnight. Then if you're uh, on a classic, kind of like my classic week, I guess, so you're either being clinic. Um, so I'm currently doing pediatrics. So we have uh, two clinics um, on a Wednesday um, where we see our elective patients. Uh, then we operate on Thursday doing our elective patients. And then Friday would be a fracture clinic. My other two days are between trauma, on calls, um, and admin, where I'm just trying to like, just firing off emails. The other aspect is fellowship, where we will cut, where we get an opportunity after we've completed our training, where we then will spend one to two years visiting other locations uh, around the world, learning new techniques from professors, and then the aim is to bring them back uh, to the UK to kind of augment that experience within the NHS. Uh, and that's a really good opportunity to go and you know anywhere in the world and you kind of you organize it off your own back our challenges in training so there's exams there's a, that's always a bit, that's 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 something that you can't, that you have to do, do and that kind of comes up and down uh, so your F, mrcs uh, you're doing ct1 and 2 um, and then your frcs you do at the end and that's next ex exit training uh, and that's something you do around st7 so i've got that in about six months time Commuting is a bit of an issue. So yeah, as I said, you'd be changing jobs every six to 12 months. Um, and that obviously is quite, can have a bit of an impact on uh, relationships, uh, managing a family. Um, and then you've also got uh, try like funding um, and having to pay for all of that. Um, it can be competitive, but I don't think that should put you off. 
Um, and there's a lot of extracurricular work that you do have to unfortunately do outside of what you get paid from your nine to five. Um, but it is a, that, that is all kind of like all part of trying to maintain a good portfolio. And unfortunately, there's not really much of a option of not getting, of trying to avoid it because those things are, that's how you score points in your interview. Um, but there are, there are ways of getting around it by working smart, which I'll get into uh, further on down the line. Um, so what's good about orthopedics? What I love about orthopedics is you treat everyone across ages. So uh, currently I'm treating kids who are between two and 18, and they're a lot of fun. And then you can be treating people well into their, um, well into their old age with their neck femur fractures, um, as well as you know, athletes with ACL ruptures, um, and you know, skiers. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a really good, interesting aspect of the job. Um, there's a lot of kits. So what that picture is down there, that's a uh, robot putting putting spinal. Sorry, uh, putting screws into the uh, putting into someone's back. So there's a lot of technological advances that we are picking up as we're going along, and they're they're going to be coming. Uh, in much sooner as well so there's a lot of equipment to play with there's always new kits um there's also sorry can you just give me two seconds i'm gonna go find a different microphone sure no problem yeah. thanks david let's try this might work. Let's see if this works. All right, does this one work? Yeah, it's a lot clearer. Thank you. This was working cool. Um, so yeah, there's a good aspect of problem solving. So whenever you're fixing a fracture, you know, you've got, it's almost like a jigsaw. So you've got to put them all together and hold, put some kind of fixation device to hold that. Um, and there's always different ways of fixing it. So, you know, there's not a single way of doing it. So it's not purely procedural. And that's what I enjoy about the discussion in the true meeting where you have different people having different ideas based on their experiences um, and their technical skills. So there's always different approaches uh, to attacking the same problem. It's also, it's also very satisfying because you have an opportunity to make a large impact on a patient's lifestyle. And it's really great, to, for example, with total hip replacements and knee replacements. They are one of the uh, top uh, procedures to improve someone's, uh, someone's uh, kind of lifestyle uh, in the NHS. Uh, and you have patients coming in, walking with pain, and then they come and you operate on them. They come back and see you within like 12 weeks and they're very happy with the outcomes generally. Um, and there's also a lot of variation within uh, orthopedics to do teaching and research and management as well. Kind of looking into the future of orthopedics, uh, we've got machine learning and AI, which are going to be coming in in the next kind of five to 10 years. The government's doing a lot of that. And that's really going to be something that's going to be impacting medicine across the board, to be honest. So it's not just orthopedics. Um, and that's something that I would, uh, we kind of need to keep an eye on an eye on over the next kind of five to 10 years. Uh, we've also got uh, augmented reality, which is an image of that is down at the bottom left. So that guy's wearing a HoloLens. Um, it's stuff that I, I haven't seen in the NHS, but we've had some kind of industry people start demonstrating it. And it allows you to do is kind of like project your CT image of the patient over, it like overlays over the patient. Um, so it almost gives you X-ray vision. Um, and then you can also play around with the stuff whilst you're in theatre it's all sterile um, you've also got the robot robots uh, on the bottom right so these are kind of the mako robots which at the moment they kind of they guide your bone cutting device so if you're doing a total knee replacement you have your bone cuts um, before you put your prosthesis in and that kind of guides your hand and if you're going out of the planned direction it 
kind of stiffens up and gives you a bit of resistance. So it means your cuts are better. There's the evidence currently isn't demonstrating that they are better than the uh, surgeons. Um, they give better CTs. So the, objectively on the X-ray, they look better. But actually, does that have an does that improve patient outcomes? That's still up for questioning. Um, and then regenerative medicine is something that will be coming in event, uh, coming in inevitably, and that will be uh, kind of like you know how, how that's going to work, kind of regenerating cartilage, how that's going to treat um, arthritis. We'll have to see how that how that goes. So, how do you become an orthopedic consultant? So, uh, this is the kind of direction. Um, I've put the salaries on because. I didn't know what the hell I was going to be earning uh, when I was a med student. And I think it's important that we, uh, that everyone's aware of it. Um, so you spend five, six years in med school. Then you spend two years doing your foundation training. Um, then you do two years core training. And then you do, spend six years doing your orthopedic specialist registrar training. And then you spend one to two years doing fellowship past that. And then you uh, are a consultant for the next 10 to 20 years. This is the classic model. Now there are jobs that are starting this called so-called run-through training. And instead of having that interview between CT2 and ST3, you just do one interview and you start, instead of CT1, you start as ST1. And then you just stay in the same place for eight years rather than, and you kind of like, you bypass that, uh, that second interview. Um, and that's really a, it's really a good option um, but obviously it means that you need to, you'd want to get that job, that run through job in the place where you're happy to spend some time in. So you're committing yourself to eight years there. So for the orthopedic application, that's the classic. So I put this, these are routes to become a consultant. So the classic route is, as I said, the one that I followed, then you've got the run through training um, below. There's now kind of like, it's called Caesar, which is a, you, uh, you, uh, it's mainly been used by overseas applicants. So these are people that have trained overseas and then they've come to the UK and they essentially have to make their own portfolio that we naturally do through training over the course of eight years and they have to formalize it. And then they present that to the Royal College of Surgeons and they kind of say, yes, this patient has been formally trained. There are now people who are doing that who are UK trained because they don't want to go through the training uh, pathway. Um, and that's only something that's really started being done over the last kind of like one to two years that I've seen. Um, it does, it is a possible training route, but you will always be playing second fiddle to the trainees. Um, and so if there's a choice between the trainee being put into a certain role or to work for a certain consultant, they will always take priority. So it is an avenue to pursue, but you, there are pros and cons to it. Um, and then there is also a few people that uh, bypass core surgical training and they just apply directly to specialist registrar training. And I've seen a few people do that. Um, they are mainly overseas trainees who end up doing a master's so at the Royal London you can do a master's at Queen Mary and you work at the Royal London and as an SHO and that gives you the um, experience in the NHS and also gives you the theatre time to then prepare for your uh, your specialist training registrar it's kind of like a, a core surgical training scheme whilst doing a master's. Um, and I've seen a few UK graduates do that as well, where they decided not to apply for CT one and two, and they've applied for, you know, a clinical fellowship role essentially, and get all of their uh, portfolio requirements, and then just apply directly to specialist registrar training. Um, so those are the kind of the four four paths up the mountain. Um, just to run through, anyone got any questions at this point? Um, because this uh, we're going to then move on to the. Um, Orthopedic, we're going to just run it, move on to the kind of like core surgical training application. No, okay, cool. Right, so um, this is all going to be coming from the core surgical training self assessment form. This is a form that is released every year. And it's basically the way that the portfolios are going to be marked for that current year. 
you, you should all you do is Google search UK course local training self assessment form and the year. Make sure that you're looking at the UK one because I was looking at the Northern Ireland one for a little bit before I realised that I was looking at the wrong one. Um, so you be just double check and it should say the NHS at the top. This is the same scoring method that is used for the CT1 pathway or the run through training um, for ST1. So the first part of your portfolio uh, is based on commitment to specialty. So you need to have passed MRCS part A um, uh, to score the maximum points. Then you need to have attended four or more surgical courses and these courses have to be uh, national or run by colleges. They can't be undergraduate um, courses. Uh, and then you have the uh, operative experience. You need to have 30 to 39 cases. Um, this can be, I've spoken to some of the core trainees who have just applied and they say that actually these are, these can be, there's no time uh, definition on it. So these are cases from med school and foundation year. Uh, but obviously that may change along the way. But it's important that you should you should start uh, an e logbook, which I'll, dis I'll discuss later. But you can you can start tracking the cases that you attend, and they need to be cases that you've assisted in or that you've performed with a supervisor present. Um, and if you start collecting them now, then you'll start clocking them up earlier. And then surgical conferences, so three or more surgical conferences to earn the maximum points. I'm just going to run through the maximum points. Um, because it is so that you can and you can see that there's uh, lesser scores that you can you can get, um, but as long as you're aiming to, for the top, then hopefully you'll maximise those scores. Um, then, if your surgical experience, you can get maximum points for doing a surgical elective, um, which has to be four weeks. So that's something to consider when you if you guys are um, planning your surgical electives at the end of your med school. I don't know how uh, it, that varies depending on which med school you go to about when you do that, pre or post exams. Then postgrad degrees. So obviously if, you, if you've done a PhD um, or if you've got, a, you score the max, um, but then it's kind of your intercalated degrees, uh, you get first class honours um, as well as uh, other degrees if you're a grad student before applying. So you get, you just kind of have to mark those up. Then you've got prizes. So these are you get them if you if you go for any prizes, then they have to be from recognised surgical institutions or conferences. So again, they can't be undergraduate things um, done within your medical school, as well as just getting a di distinction in your final year at undergraduate level. So um, that's that's how you get that's how they score the prizes. Now with audit, this is, you have to have led all the aspects of a surgically themed clinical audit. I don't know what they mean by surgically themed, but I guess it has to be either looking at the surgical uh, department. Um, but there, there, there are there, I couldn't find a specific definition for that. Uh, but obviously, it can't be something specific to medicine. Um, but you have to be involved in all the stages, and you also have to present it. So you can't just have collected the results. You have to then present it locally to back to the department um, that you uh, did the audit for. So that's a question of timing as well, because sometimes there's a bit of a lag between you completing an audit and then presenting it locally. It can be, you know, you have to wait for that audit meeting to happen. So that's something that you need to consider when you're applying that you have given enough time to have presented it. Teaching experience. Um, so to get max points, you need to have organized and designed uh, teaching program. And there has to be a maximum of four sessions of that teaching program, um, as well as contributing to teaching of four sessions. And in order to provide evidence you've done those sessions, you need to have feedback. So it's, it's just at the end of each session, what you can do, uh, which is what I do is I create Google Forms and then you quickly give them a QR code, scan them and get them to do that right there and then. The next one is tra training and teaching. So you have to, you can get, you can do extra masters um, or PG cert um, outside to try and get uh, get these points. Obviously, that means it's a bit more challenging because this takes time out of your training. You can do part time masters as you're going along, uh, but obviously that that adds to your workload. 
now with presentations so more points are given to oral presentations at a national or international level um, and then posters you have to be uh, first or first author um, of two or more uh, to be presented to get the next next level publications they've really locked down on um, and make it makes it a lot more challenging so you can't so case reports and editorial letters are no longer included they have to be pubmed cited so that means that when you it means you have to have a pubmed id so that's really important when you're uh submitting your papers to um certain journals just check that they're pubmed citable and you can find that on uh you can find uh, that on out on pubmed um and you'll you can find out what journals they are they are then sorry i just got a message so that's something just to check as you're going along You can also write chapters to books, but again, that takes a long time to do. Research and publications is is the hardest thing, I think, to score on, um, mainly because just the time lag on publications is, 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 it can take six months. So, you know, you can spend two, three months on a project, writing it up, and then by, you submit it to the journal, but then it can take, you know, up to six months before it actually gets published. So this is something that you need to um, start early on if you're planning on... Um, planning on scoring points on it you can also see that the collaborative authors um, so if you're a part of star surge or covid search they don't score um, as highly um, but they are a lot easier to get and you in order to score you need to get three or more pubmed cited publications we also have an aspect called leadership management so you need to be holding a national leadership or managerial role for more than six months and demonstrate a positive impact. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, maybe that's on feedback or if you've tried to create a project. Um, but again, you can try, try and get evidence of that through letters. Um, and then you, you might be able to hold a regional um, or leadership managerial role if you're involved in, say, um, Say some kind of so for your so you can get a be a representative of on a foundation program or on your uh, um, so that you can be a kind of go between between the uh, foundation program and the the, the other uh, the foundation doctors that would be an example of a regional regional role whereas the national role would be say the BMA that would be that would be another uh, or or, or part of like ACIT. Um, so on the core surgical interview day. It comprises of a 20-minute interview made up of two 10-minute sections. And these are back-to-back, -back, and you present to the same panel. Currently, it's virtual due to COVID. When I did it, it was face-to-face, -face, and we did it in the Strand, in a hotel in the Strand. I don't know whether it's going to change for you guys in the next few years, um, but we'll have to see. The portfolio cutoff score was 47 this year, and it was 36 last year. Apparently, the reason for the difference in points was because, again, they adjusted the self-assessment. The stations that you'll have are split into... So the first one will be a clinical station. You'll get two questions, um, and generally they're on the on the line of uh, a deteriorating patient um, so this is a either a patient with a post-op fever maybe an ischemic limb maybe post-op compartment syndrome or they might be asking you to assess a patient uh, who's at a trauma call so it's your ATLS principles um, and the next station will be a presentation station where you present for three minutes that title below it, Reflect on Your Experience on Leadership as Part of a Team and How This Will Be Useful as a Core Surgical Training, has been used for the last two years. And you will have prepared that presentation, and I'd recommend that you practice it many times, um, because even if you think you know it, wait until you're sat in front of three strangers, um, you, you can start to stumble at that point. And then they will then quiz you about the subject um, and about your experiences and what you've discussed. Then there'll be 
another question about management. So this is kind of like your management and ethical dilemma question. So either it'll be you've got two patients uh, who've got the same name and one of them has got had a scan, but it's for the wrong patient. So you kind of have to discuss, you have to go and you apologize to the wrong patient. Also make sure that that patient's safe and then uh, get that get that patient sorted first and then de- deal with the patient that's got, who's got the wrong, wrong scan and how you would apologize and all that stuff. I got a question that was about a patient's relative accessing their, uh, accessing their files. Um, so obviously there's a patient confidentiality issue. You might be need to discuss about consenting um, with consent with a consenting patient who's not got capacity, or discussing DNARs. You may have a consultant who's uh, come onto the ward drunk, or smelling alcohol, or you know, and then, then generally these are, these kind of discussions will then build onto um, protocols. So, for example, if you're consenting or there's issues during the like wrong li- wrong side limb surgery, you will then start discussing the WHO checklist and things like that. Um, so that's generally the interview day. And then after that, you'll get ranked according to your score. And then you rank a load of jobs on Oriol. Um, it's probably like two to three hundred jobs. And then depending on your position in the pecking order, what you, you, you'll get then get your... Um, your allocated job. So obviously the first per- person that comes top gets their first choice that knocks out that. And then the second person in the queue then chooses their job. So um, it's important to, you know, obviously score as high as you can, but the, well, if there are two patient, two, two people candidates that have the same score, it then the system will then randomize you, um, which can, and the uh, spread of scoring can be quite narrow. So there could be maybe like a hundred people with only difference of 10 points. So that does make it, there is an element of randomization in there. It's pretty much the same for special, for your SC3 interview. It's just a bit more in depth. Um, you have a portfolio station, clinical station, leadership station. There's also a operative station. So you have to demonstrate some manual skills. So you have to demonstrate your knot tying capabilities, perhaps um, putting on a plate. You'll have some questions about uh, basic surgical skills. You'll have to communicate with a patient um, and maybe deliver some bad news, uh, take a history. And then there might be a handover um, or operating this prioritization where you'll be at handover. You'll be given seven patients that you need to go and review immediately. They're all immediate immediate issues. So you may you probably have one that needs to go to surgery, a compartment syndrome, an ischemic limb, a kid with a supracondylar fracture. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's an impossible situation. Um, but the idea is that that you need to prioritize it and justify your decision making um, and then they evaluate you on that. Um, so it's the same as a CT interview. It's just there's a little bit extra that they, you need to add, but that's based on your experiences that you should have gathered over the two years of your course of surgical, surgical training. I don't really want to go into more detail about that because that is so far in the future. Um, so it's likely would have changed by the time you guys get there. This is just to um, run through my current situation. So I'm currently year four of six um, in my registrar training. And it's these are all the aspects that I need to cover to over those six years. So I need to have rotated around all of the areas of orthopedics. There's all those subspecialties. I've got portfolio. I need to have done 1800 cases by the end of my six years. I need to have two publications. So I need to still be involved in research. I need to do six cycles of audit. So um, I need to be involved in audit uh, 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 most of the time. You need, ha- need to be teaching uh, medical students or core surgical trainees. There's also an element of management where you have to have done a course. You need to be up to date with the ATLS and also you need to have passed your final exam. So it's it, just, to, just to show you that all of this stuff is all the same stuff that you do at course surgical training. There's nothing new that comes along. You just need to be accumulating it as you're going along. Um, and unfortunately, the treadmill doesn't really stop once you once you become a registrar. So these are my tips um, for you guys who are in, interested in doing orthopedics in med school. Um, and to be honest, this doesn't need to be just for orthopedics because for the core surgical interview process all that portfolio stuff if you look at if you wanted to think if you're kind of like in a dilemma of anesthetics or whether you want to do a and e 
a lot of this stuff is all kind of the same across the sp across the board. And obviously, you know, you get you get we can go back to the um, what was it some of the some of the teaching where yeah, the audit needs to be surgically themed, but you still only lose two points if you're doing a project that may have been in medicine. So these are, and I, I don't know what the other application processes if they've specified it, but um, you can still score points by getting involved in other aspects. So it doesn't necessarily need to be directly involved with orthopedics. The first step is to have a look at your portfolio, or if you don't have a portfolio, just get a folder and start. Now you know the areas um, that you'll be needing to target and identify those areas of weakness. Um, and if you have got nothing, then it's a good opportunity to target the low hanging fruit or the longest time requirements. What I mean by low hanging fruit, it's like it's if you've got if you know you could do an audit um, if you're if you're in a uh, if you're doing a surgically orientated um, rotation at the moment. But those that require the longest time requirements are things like other other publications. So depending on where your weaknesses are, you may want to target one or the other. Um, and make a plan. So identify those areas of weakness. Try and work out where you can sort, where you can reach those targets. I recommend setting deadlines um, and objectives, just so that you have an idea of how long it's going to take. And also, it means that you'll you, you'll be stimulated to try and reach those deadlines. Because if you just kind of just say, "I want to do this project," and then you have this kind of like goal that's somewhere in the future it's very difficult to keep track on that and to keep keep motivated on it and try and be strategic about it obviously it's important to develop a network so you can uh, contact your orthopedic department so the people to target within your orthopedic department would be the clinical director of orthopedics the professor of orthopedics there or the educational lead those guys are kind of will be able to um direct if they are not involved in it they can direct you to the person that you should be speaking to find mentors so if you've got to so speak to those people when you're on rotations and t tell them that you're keen in orthopedics um, and they want any guidance and they may be able to advise you or get you involved in um, get you involved in projects as you're coming along because as i've said, said we're all as trainees have this criteria that we need to be filling we all need to be doing audits we all need to be doing research and you know we need help with that so having a medical student on board uh, is is extremely useful uh, the other thing is to find people within your own at your own level as medical students and as you're going through FY and CT, find people that are like-minded and are also keen to do orthopedics or in surgery, because it really helps to have someone to bounce ideas off and also to support you within those projects. Um, so form student groups, join your join your societies, um, and. If it was just a quick mention about managing seniors. So if you need a letter for your portfolio, write the letter and write explicitly according to the self-assessment what you had done in that project. Because if, if, you've, made, if you've designed and organized um, an educational system, an educational program and delivered four sessions, you need to write that explicitly because that's that terminology is what they're going to be looking for in the interview and people have had issues where that terminology hasn't been explicit enough and so they, they don't score enough points also hassle people so you know we're all very busy working in the nhs and we're not ignoring your email because we're being malicious we're just probably like it's just probably fallen through and it's just been missed under the deluge of emails that we get sent on a daily basis so you know just always just follow up if you haven't had a reply uh to an email just follow it up in a few days or a week um and just say hey by the way just uh, just wondering um if it, you know if, it, if if you could get some uh get some contact on that or just go in and find them physically because it makes it makes it a lot quicker and i really just uh, just encourage you guys if you're interested in orthopedics to just tell people that you're interested um and demonstrate enthusiasm um, and always ask to get involved. So don't take that no personally. You know, you're not going to lose anything by asking to get scrubbed in theatre, um, or maybe you want to be involved in reducing that fracture. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's busy, or you know, it's a bit more complex. You may not th you think that it's complex, but there may be a reason why that registrar or um, course surgical trainee wants to do that. Wants to do that part of the uh, part of the operation or something because maybe he needs it for his own training. But you know, if it, all they're going to do is say no 
and you, you've not lost anything. Um, however, they may because they because we're so involved in the procedure that we're involved. Sometimes you know you can forget that there's a medical student medical student on the other side, and you know just saying hey, uh, you know, kind of reminds them, and they might just be like, yeah, sure, you can do this. Um, so yeah, seize all the opportunities you can get. Just a question on projects. Just a, well, not a question, but just on projects. Just always check authors on PubMed because if someone says that something's publishable you want to go with the people that have published and the easiest way to check if people are being published is to search their name on pubmed and go for the authors that have, uh, that have published a lot because they are the guys that know how to get stuff published and have a history of publishing um, because plenty of people will tell you that this project will get published but i mean to have, I've, I've, I've definitely had quite a few projects that were that haven't been published that i was told that were um, so that's one way of double checking. You can also speak to the educational centre um, about, you know, creating uh, teaching programmes for students, um, either other medical students or other trainees. Um, at the start of projects, always clarify the roles, because I think that it's really frustrating when you do a project and you think that you're going to be first author and then suddenly you get to the end and someone says, oh, no, I'm going to be first author. So and always put that in writing. So put that in an email. So you be, so you've defined roles and it's time stamped and everyone's involved. So it's very clear at the start who's going to be first author, and that means normally you know the first author should be writing the paper. So that that also means that you're not doing extra work and then someone's taking credit for it. And because it's on email, it's been time stamped and sent to everyone. If someone starts kicking off in the future, you can just refer back to this email and say, look, no, we agreed on this. You know, three months ago, this was how. It was. Um. And also, like what I mean by stacking projects. So what you can do is, rather than doing five projects um, and spreading yourself around, just focus on one quality project and just build on it. So you can. So for example, I did an audit. Uh, the audit was something that the department needed. Um, I presented it locally. I got you know you get a prize for the local presentation. The, the audit was good enough to be published and then you present that you can present that pub, that publicated that publication nationally so that is all from one project i've managed to get a prize an audit and a publication all from collecting from one single data set rather than doing trying to create five different data sets and, and putting all the eggs in different baskets just try and find quality projects and build on that project and stack it all up the other thing is to have when you've got a group of you who are all like-minded you can if you're all doing that be all working on each other's projects it means that you're you're not you, you're helping each other out and you know you can have three or four people working on publications and then getting yourself involved so you know you may not be first author but you're you're you'll get your um you're getting your name on other projects so that's part of like working smart i think Next thing is prizes. So there are a lot of undergraduate conferences and a lot of them are free. So submit abstracts to them and they accept they, they accept a lot of them for posters um, and then uh, and public and also oral presentations. And there are a lot of essay prizes. So you can check up uh, the essay prizes on the Royal Colleges, the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, BOTA is the British Orthopaedic Training Association and BOA is the British Orthopaedic Association. ACITS, uh, the surgical national surgical um, uh, in training, I think it is, and FOS is future um, orthopedic surgeons. All of these will have annual um, essay prizes, um, and check these websites, um, and then you can submit to them. Normally, especially for the Royal Society of Medicine, they have a lot of prizes in niche areas uh, that may, may not be surgical, but not many people put their put submissions for essays on so in competition ratios they're much lower for these essay prizes so there, there there's a lot of good opportunity there and the essays are not very long they're normally like 800 to 1500 words so you can normally just smash it out within um a weekend or so uh operative experience so yeah like i said it starts at med school you can create your own log e-log book so that's a website that you uh that you go on and you can register and there's also an e-logbook phone app, which I thoroughly recommend, um, which means that you can 
input your data on your phone. You do have to pay for it, but it means that uh, you can do it automatically at the end of a list so that you don't forget further on down the line. With regards to the MRCS Part A, um, I think the statistics show that the uh, pass rates are higher the closer to med school you do it because obviously a lot of it's um uh basic sciences and things and the further on down you you, you you'll find that you forget stuff as soon as you leave med school so the sooner you do it um the better what should you be doing between in your foundation jobs so there's always a kind of a, a dilemma tertiary center versus district general um in a tertiary center so if you can so if the rural end is a tertiary center the sho is there um, they don't get to theatre as much and it is a very busy job. But what they are seeing is far more complex stuff. And when they do get to theatre, you know, you're seeing really um, high level orthopedics. Uh, whether that's relevant to you at that level, I'm not sure. But it is, it is an experience that is rather unique. Working at District General Hospital, you can see more basic level trauma. You're probably going to have a little bit of a quieter job and you're probably going to have more access to theatre, I think. Surgical job, whether to do it in FY1 or FY2. Uh, I would suggest to do it in the FY2 because you'll be on the on-call rotor. Um, and that experience of doing surgical on-calls um, will help your learning and prepare you for core surgical training, as well as uh, solidifying some of your knowledge for your MRCS Part B, because there's a lot of general surgery in there and kind of like how you uh, should be treating patients in a more uh, clinical setting. And I think that it's a lot easier to remember stuff when you've actually seen it in real life. However, some of my colleagues have also suggested doing it in FY1, especially doing, he suggested a, doing a urology job in FY1 because there's a lot of high volume um, surgery that you can just jump in and out of. And that was his suggestion. So that that's what he, he just done the CT interviews. Um, and that, that's another option. But I think that in FY1, you're mainly ward based. Speciality choice um, uh, doesn't really make much of a difference. Obviously, orthopedics, if you do it in FY2, I think that gives you a more um, more valid experience of orthopedics because you'll be you'll be able to see uh, what goes on in orthopedics. It'll be a real struggle to apply for orthopedics if you've never done it before. You may be in for a bit of a, a eye opener. Um, and I'd also recommend doing an A and E placement because even though it's not uh, surgically uh, involved, it's just really helps with your decision making as a doctor you're seeing patients who are unwell or who aren't unwell and you really learn that clinical um, decision making it really helps you do lose four months of your life but it has a, a massive impact um, on the rest of your training um, just just being able to have done a and e we also recommend uh, checking the uh, core surgical training self-assessment again when you're in foundation year because obviously depending on where you are now in med school that is very likely to have changed so you'll then be able to reevaluate where your portfolio is at that point if you're going to do part a i think you guys all do a community placement now i did a psychiatry placement um, and it's normally these gp placements and psych placements have a lot of downtime and it's a really good opportunity to revise for your mrcs I also suggest making a five-year plan when you start as an FY1. Um, it seems a bit crazy. I definitely thought it was crazy at that point when I was told to do it. But it really helps to plan how your career is going to um, move. And so you can move with intention rather than just randomly bouncing around jobs. Um, and even if you're not, if you don't stick to it, um, it just kind of gives you a little bit of a north star in where you're heading. Um, and obviously you can devi deviate and adapt to going along. Um, but it really, it really did help me when I when I started making a five year plan. The other question is whether to do an FY three job, um, or you know just take a year, take a year out. I thoroughly recommend it. Um, it makes no impact on your application. When I was doing it years ago, it only really people had just started doing it, and you know we were worried about justifying uh, whether it was going to come up in interview and whether we had to justify our, our choices. I've never heard anyone being asked about their foundation year, uh, their, their year out um, and having to justify it. Uh, and I would also recommend if you are taking a year out to still apply for core surgical uh, for your for your interview, because it's super useful just to go through the process. Um, you get the experience. You'll also have prepared your portfolio. And it will just make the next time that you're going through going for the interview after year out a hundred times easier. 
because you have that previous experience and you also will have made your portfolio and you just be building on it. Um, so yeah, you can do all of these things. Also just locum um, and buy a house is what some of my friends have done. All right, guys, so that's the end of it. It's just a little uh, Venn diagram of an orthopedic surgeon. We're essentially DIY, a combination of DIY people with the Bob the Builder who try and do good things like Jesus. Uh, and we also wield a hammer like Mjolnir, like Thor. Um, the QR code at the bottom right is the Mind the Bleep um, feedback sheet. And I've been told to encourage you guys to fill that out because I think you guys get um, some certificates at the end if you fill that out. And that's the only way you're going to get your certificate. Cool. So uh, I finished now. Um, has anyone got any questions? Um, fire it off. Super. Thank you so much, David. That was really, really interesting and really informative as well. Um, so hopefully if the attendees have any questions, pop them in the chat and we'll read them out as they come. But in, in just to get us kicked off, I'm quite curious. What did you do to build up your own portfolio and how did you find the time to complete them? Uh, so I did the hard route and I would thoroughly recommend no one do it. I basically decided at FY2 that I wanted to do orthopedics. I had done very little preparation for that role. Um, and I quickly had to uh, get get everything together. So I did my audits in six months or so. And I also need to uh, emphasize that having gone through the self-assessment uh, my five years ago the self-assessment was no nowhere near as uh thorough as it is for you guys so i i was able to quickly gather the, all of the portfolio stuff up um i didn't have any publications um and i yeah i managed to get my i managed to get my uh first choice job i decided to leave london for core surgical training because the opportunities for uh getting into theater are much higher if you're working in dghs um uh, so that's why I left to go and do that. Um, but I hadn't done my exam uh, and that really had an impact on my core surgical training. So I was uh, I was I had to do my MRCS part A and B uh, in my first year, which meant that I basically disappeared for nine months um, because I was just doing exams back to back. So I, again, I thoroughly recommend doing your exams early. It also makes a huge difference uh, to your core surgical training if you've already done your exams because that will then allow you to build on your portfolio and just do audits and research at that point. And then, you know, you're way ahead of everyone else. Um, the other thing I did was when I was in my basic surgical skills and why I emphasize about ask it, just asking, I was just doing a basic surgical skills and I, I just asked a consultant if he had any projects. Um, and he basically just asked me if I, if I wanted a job just because I, and we got, I got projects through that basically. So, you know, you know, you never know who you're going to meet um, and just ask, ask people. And normally, you know, people will just show, show if you've shown enthusiasm, um, they're, they're, they're happy to encourage it. So he really um, went out on a limb giving me my kind of like my FY3 job uh, having just met me for like 30 minutes but I was very grateful for that sure thank you so is that, am I right in saying that you didn't have any publications is that before CT1 application yeah no I didn't have any uh yeah I had no application uh yeah before CT1 I had no no publications I just had I just done a lot of audits um that's what I so that's what I mean by getting the low-hanging fruit I was also working in DGHs which didn't have uh a lot of research potential in the departments so that's another thing if you're the the bonus of working in tertiary centers is that that's where the professors are that's where the high volume data is um and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of research that's going in to these tertiary centers so you, it's a lot easier to get that um high quality publications coming out there and that's something that i wasn't involved in uh during my early training um, and i'm seeing a lot of my colleagues who are junior to me working in these tertiary centers and they're getting involved in a lot more um, so that, that's where the kind of like the, one of the pros are of working in tertiary centres. Sure, thank you so much. Um, so, in terms of your own career, what are the biggest challenges and positives you've encountered in orthopaedic surgery? Um, the moving around is a big challenge. That's pro that's probably the biggest challenge, the uncertainty of it. Um, the that that unfortunately that's part of the job. There's not really much uh 
there's not really much of a much way of getting around it really you kind of like have to accept that you will um, end up moving around one of the ways of controlling for that is to choose small deaneries um, and that depends very much on where you live so for example you know east the east midlands deanery has one of the small smallest deaneries and you can you can commute uh for an hour and you'll you'll pretty much cover all of the spaces so most people live in leicester but you know east of england has a massive deanery and people are commuting like two hours i've heard um so that's one way of controlling it so depending on which deanery you choose um and the i guess i guess the other ones are kind of you know the the research um and the exams uh yeah there is it is a bit of a time commitment um and just uh, the, the only advice that I had from my from my consultant when I was having that issue, he just said, "Just don't fail it," um, because that that kind of, which is a bit a bit frustrating advice. But you know, if you if you are failing exams, it just means that you've got another four months to six months that you've just lost, and you can't. You, you then have to allocate that time to revising rather than allocating that time to doing audit or research, and that puts you behind the guys that have passed. So. Yeah, you just have to kind of just really sit down and nail those exams, and then once they're done, they're done. So, um, yeah, it, it, the, I'm not going to deny that surgical training can be challenging, but then most of medicine, you're not going to, you, you're going to be doing exams in all of the specialties, so you can't really avoid it, unfortunately. Um, the good things about surgery, I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff, stuff that I, you know, <laughs> um, stuff that uh, can kind of scare your uh, scare your dinner companions. Um, so it's, <laughs> That means that I've had to kind of tone it down, or at least check uh, check that we've everyone's everyone's finished eating first. Um, so that that you do get to see some amazing things, I think, um, and being able to have patients come in who have such serious problems and then watch them leave hospital is extremely satisfying, um, and that's a very unique experience that you won't get um in other areas of medicine, or if you choose to lose leave medicine, you know, working in office, you know, you don't really see that at all um yeah sure thank you um i don't think we've had any questions from the audiences yet so i will check in another one um so in terms of your you when you said that you were bouncing around from place to place during your course surgical training is that the same thing is that what happens also during registrar training yeah, so it depends on which uh, rotation you're on. But mm -hmm. so I'm on the Royal London rotation, and we generally have uh, six months to a year rotations. So it's it's really good to so our TPD uh, Mr. Actor uh, tr encourage it, it tries to keep us in one place for a year. So that really helps with you establishing yourself with the orthopedic department um, because normally within six months it takes you three months to work out how this hospital works. Uh, how your consultants work, whether the consultants trust you, and then you find in the last three months that you um, start getting to do more things more independently. However, if you were there for a year, you know the word gets around within the department. It means that your next six month placement, you kind of you're kind of doing it on fast forward. Um, and generally, people will spend. They normally commute. Most of our guys live either in East London or they live in Essex, um, and generally there's no more than in an hour an hour an hour, an hour to an hour and a half um commute i found and would this commuting have to be regardless of which training pathway in surgery you go down i think generally um yeah i, I mean i can't comment for other i can't comment unfortunately for other specialties because i have no experience of that um but it, it and i don't know how their deaneries work but yeah you will be moving around certain areas but those deaneries can be smaller in certain specialties super thank you so much um i don't think we've had any questions from the audience so i feel like you must have gone through everything pretty <laughs> you must have done a good job um so thank you so much david for speaking and also thank you everyone for attending um, so just another reminder to fill out the feedback, feedback form because we'll send out certificates to the email addresses that we get from it. And then obviously we'll share everything with you as well, David. Um, so super. Thanks a lot. Thank you much, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good evening. You too. You too. Take care.